I just want to say I'm really thrilled to be working. I, I want to thank Polly, first of all, for uh, for organizing everything and pulling this together for us uh, with the folks from Photo Lucidia, Cri uh, Critical Mass. We're thrilled to have you guys. And one thing to let everybody know um, who is new, and we see a lot of new folks, which is great. If anyone would like to present moving forward, just reach out to me. We'd love to have you present. You know, certainly, and it doesn't matter whether you're a finalist or not. We would love to have you present. We're always always looking for um, people to present. Um, I thank uh, our sponsors, which is Photo Shelter, Epson, Pro Photo Daily, American Photography. Um, and I do ask everyone, if you have a moment, just and Jay will put it into the chat room, to uh, subscribe to our YouTube page. That would be great. Two other pieces of business. Um, again, for new people, uh, what we've been doing over the course of last year, and now it's a little bit over a year, we've been doing solid weeks of presentations from photojournalists who have been covering the war in Ukraine. Um, and it's really it's really been terrific. We've had over 45 presenters doing that. So that's going to happen uh, the week of January 8th through the 12th. Also, with the tragedy that's going on in uh, in Israel and Gaza, we're going to be doing a solid week from photojournalists covering that that conflict uh, the week of December 11th through the 15th. So that will be coming up. So you, you'll get notices on that. But tonight it's all about critical mass. And I cannot thank, again, Polly for helping set this all up. The um, three great presenters that we'll have, which is Daniel Sackham, uh, Sarah Hoskins, and Rudy Rowe. And with that, it's all you now, Rudy. You're on. Share your screen and off we go. So again, thank you, everybody. There it is. All right. So first, let me... Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yeah, you first, le first, let me um thank everybody, including the those folks at Critical Mass for inviting me for, to this presentation. Um, I'm all, it's always an honor for me to to show work, no matter whatever stage or or platform it's on. There's always there's always a, a feeling of 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 reverence because I I'm very close to my images. Um, every every month every every six months, every year, um, I'm, I always have to tackle why I make images. What is it am I trying to say? And um, and over the years, I find that I, I try to make images that are very textured, but are simple. Images that just speak for themselves. Can everybody hear me? Am I good? Yeah, yeah you're uh, good, Rudy. So th these 25 images I'm, that I'm going to present are images that, for me, are as as I as I'd like to put it, I grew up I grew up in Jamaica. I grew up around um, poverty that I didn't really call poverty because I, I didn't see it as a child. You don't really see poverty. You just see this is how I live. And it wasn't until I grew up and I started to to go to my other friends' home who had big houses and mansions and maids, and I was like, oh, so this is how the other people live but as a photographer and, and and being sent out on assignments by time new york times not geo i always gravitated towards people that reminded me of where i grew up and so these images are are that for me they're they're the 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 stories i remember harry belafonte right after katrina he was asking an interview by spike lee what is it that made America take so long to go to Kat Katrina? And he said, America took so long to go to Katrina because the people in the South are a forgotten people. And I remember watching um, the documentary and asking myself, who, what, is, what is a forgotten people? Who are the forgotten people? And I, and, and I was also going through my, what is going to be my voice? What are my images going to look like? And I was feeling Avedon really hard around this time. And I remember going to, to the South with a four by five, um, a bunch of Polaroids. And I did my little, I did my little Avedon. And then when I came back to New York, I got a job to work at Vogue as an assistant to a photographer, Kevin Sturman, for two years. And in it, I was 
I felt like what I took from that experience was the idea that no matter where your station is in life, I should throw dignity on you. I should clothe you in dignity. And that image, no matter where you're from, should have the look uh, of somebody who is on a runway or who is in front of one of the, the giant um, fashion photographers. And so when I go out on the street, I, I kind of like, I, I try to photograph the, the people, I call them my collaborators, in the same way. So I love to put words in my images. Like as a writer, that's what I went to college for. I find that the marine of words and imagery suits the vision I have. So here are my images. And Rudy, at what age did you come to the States? 20 years old. So you were 20, okay. 20, went to college at 24 left at 28, went back to Jamaica, 29, and found photography really at 29. I was a writer all the way up until, like writing was my vocation. That, that was what I was gonna do. I was gonna be a teacher, I was gonna write. Novels were in my future, and then I got a camera. Okay. So I mean, Simply, I can tell you, I mean, this was, this was shot 2023. I photographed in 2023, um, also in 2023. Um, I, I met Lewis on the street and I asked if I could photograph him on the 4th of July. When I went there, this was how he was ready for his image. And so part of what I also try to speak to is this idea of what does America mean to the African-American. As an outsider, I come with all these questions because my liberation through Jamaica was somewhat different. Um, there, were, there, were, there were a lot more wars and insurrections. And, and what format are you shooting these on? These are digital. Okay. Okay. Um, for me, I, I like details. I like, I like the little love navel ring um, but I also like the fact that I believe that whoever where you, wherever you are you put on your clothes as a way of expressing something whether it's internal whether it's external and so I try to capture that dignity and that beauty I also look for words everywhere and, and for me um that word on his on his boxes, and and Rudy, I mean, so you're here about twenty five years now. Um, years. Twenty, I am fifty four. So, so you're here thirty four years. Thirty four years. Do you still consider yourself an outsider? Every day, because I think the outsider is the mentality. Okay, the culture is different. I just say that from you know living in Cleveland, living in New York, I mean you're you're you know you're you're yeah. touching the fabric of our country. I've lived in New York for 24 years. I've lived in Cleveland for six for for two years, total of 26 years, um, nonstop. It's I mean I I I gravitate towards towards these faces and these voices as my voices and my face but my sensibility the way I move the way I talk still carries a very Jamaican a very hard son of a republic voice not necessarily the voice of somebody who have has gone through the history that African Americans have gone through in this culture. So my way of being and way of sitting in this country is completely different. Mm. And and what what would the transition for you? Like you said, you found the camera that moved you away from the written word. I mean, because obviously listening to you, you're very you know you, you're speaking and and you're very eloquent. For I, I me, mean, for me, there's no difference. Yeah. For me, for me, every image that I take is an essay or a poem. 
<laughs> I wrote short stories and po my my major was creative writing. English, English, but concentration in creative writing. Um, so everything for me is a poem. Even the putting together of this deck, I try to structure it in a way like from this guy, kid holding a toy gun to this kid with the power cat um pick in his ear. Like where do where do they get their strength from? Mm. Um the red, white, and blue constantly. Like, I don't believe people just pick and choose, even if it's on a subconscious level. For me, there is a reaching out to be to be known, to be noted, to be respected, to feel like America is a part of me. I'm a part of America. And so I don't take this image for granted. Like, this image is not just somebody who subconsciously woke up and said, you know, I'm going to wear Jordan today. And it's, it's a red, I didn't buy this red, white, and blue shirt for no reason mm -hmm. um the so, gab so the gab are, are you, i'm sorry rudy so are you giving a lot of direction to these folks you know on how to stand and you know a feeling that you're trying to get from them my the only direction i have is seated in for instance this image um i walked around cleveland this was a very early image um, I was hired by the Cleveland Library to do a, 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 a an essay on the, the 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 different townships in Cleveland, and I walked by this this bus stop, and I saw that the the ballot something I don't remember what the words were. Your life will change, but I saw that as mm, this could be a picture, and in like fifteen minutes, this guy walks by, and I go. Can I take your portrait? And that's where I wanted to take his portrait because that gavel has changed so many lives in this country who are African-Americans. That gavel, the boom, you got 20 years. Boom, you got 10 years. Boom, you got five years. Mm. For me, I'm always trying to tell you something. There's always a message in. And it is there. It is there in the words always a message but i also don't i don't go out and like beat people over the head no pun intended like it's there if you can read it if you can't you missed it right why is okay it's not moving it's not moving what happened um, are you hitting the right curve? Uh, right. You can button? be towards oh. the end of the selected images. Excuse me. You can be towards the end of the selected images. Um, it's twenty five. This is way. This is not twenty five. Hold on. Uh, how do I do this? Go here. Okay. Yep. So you're twenty two. So just go back to your finder and just queue them up. Okay, and then. So that was 22, your, your gentleman there. So what happened? Yeah, you just have to queue them up. I don't think you selected them. So if you go back to your finder and to where your images were. Okay. Um, uh, Lord. See, that's it. That's You have to put the rest. You only have 25. I have 25 here. So yeah. I don't know what happened. Open that's 25, right. yes. There we go. Is it there? there. Um, we'll see. Okay. It's not allowing me to move. Oh, wait. It's going, it's going backwards, which I... Actually, it's not in any order. Um, It doesn't matter. I can just talk. Okay. Um, so, I do, I do, as a photographer, move around. I, I, I photograph normally the same stories. This story was about a, a, a young man that I, I met in um in in Pork and Beans in Florida. Um I remember driving out to Pork and Beans, they saw me, all, guns out, I came out of the truck, introduced myself, and for two weeks we had an amazing experience. I promised that I would photograph uh 
a video for him. Two weeks later, I went to Mississippi, got a call. He got a hundred bullets, drove back to Mississippi to just to finish the story. And this is this is a picture of his mom. This is his room, which is untouched. And his mom has his urn in his hand. That's the, that's, that's the last I saw of him, an urn. Um, and the pork and beans every Thanksgiving has like they call the the turkey bowl, and it's like they play football. And I remember taking this picture. The guy that's on the um on the chain is somebody that is in jail. Um, and I remember when they were putting this this chain on him, it felt like the baton was being passed on to the next generation mm. of guys who are gonna come up in the pork and beans. So so that young kid is now in jail, Rudy? Which one? The young boy here or the or the no, 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 no. The one on the, the necklace. Okay. There okay. is I don't I don't want to say that there's a because it's not. It's more like it's really hard to explain. Again, I feel like as an outsider, I cannot speak completely for a culture that I'm also trying to learn. But I know that the 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 trauma between or the grieving period between somebody that goes to prison, somebody that is killed, and and this these people that are like trying to live, it is so short. Like somebody dies. I, I mean, I photograph a, a kid after the turkey bowl, after, and while I was still in pork and beans, he died like he was shot two or three days later. And I remember a lot of people were like DMing me saying, can we get that picture? Because we know you photographed him. It is so short, the grieving period. And so an image like this for me speaks to the life cycle of young black youth in the poker beans. Mm. Yeah, it, it, the, the kid's face is really interesting in that it's a young face, but the eyes are older. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I yes. mean, it's like, as you really look through, the, the kid looks like a seasoned, you know, street kid. He's grown up. Yeah, I mean, he has a beautiful innocence, but th there's a piece of that that's... Um... Even, even his body language, this, his yeah. texture, like the way he stands in the picture. Um, I also do a, a, a lot of assignments that... that this one, I had no idea about. I had no idea. And that's why I wanted you to see the arrangement. Um, that a kid between 12 and 15 has to pay all his court, his or her court fees. Mm -hmm. And if they don't pay their court fees, they go to jail. Like, all these different stories come out in this story, this book that I'm trying to do, When Living is a Protest. Um, because you're 15. Where, I mean, my son cannot work until he's 17. So where are you going to, where are you going to get a job between 13 and 17 that will allow you to pay for your, your ankle bracelet, your court fees, all that. And, and how long did you spend at Pork and Beans? And explain Pork and Beans a, a little bit more, Rudy. Um, pork and Beans it was or is a part of the Li Liberty City um, development in Miami. Um, I was there for like at least three months, one month each time. Um, the story initially was about mythology um, and the legacy of the hood legend, the hood or neighborhood legend. Um, and I think when I first came to this country, there was this, there was this lingo, you know, that black men do not live until the, until after 21. Like it was like a statistic. And so um, TK lived until he was 27. But a lot of youth, like by the time I left pork and beans, I knew of three guys that were killed in the pork and beans. Um, the pork and beans, um, Liberty City is one of the highest 
points of Miami. Um, they have since demolished sections of pork and beans for redevelopment. Uh, and so there's a lot of displacement happening as we speak. But the migratory pattern, like I remember when I first put up some images from pork and beans, there were Jamaicans who said, you know, when we first moved to America, we had houses, we had apartments at the pork and beans. It was like the first stop for African Americans or other migra immigra migrate immigrants who first moved to America through Miami. So the pork and beans was kind of like the first place that people came to before moving all over. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is another young lady who she has to pay for that ankle bracelet. Um, she, I think she's like 15. And if she doesn't pay for it, I think it's 60 bucks a month. Um, she goes to jail. She's not working. Symbolisms. I like to use symbolisms in my work. Um, this chain, of course, around a shirt that has Looney Tunes. And again, as we 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 just said, um, these kids are not just they're not allowed to be kids. They're they're attached and tethered to the history of this of this country. Plus, that's Jesse Owens all the way over to the right. And the idea that there is this person to live to live up to. There is a black man who was able to make it out of the ghetto or make it out of the housing project. This, this, this housing project is actually the Othwit housing project in Cleveland, where a congressman, can't remember his name right now, was a, came from. Like he grew up in Othwit and became a congressman from Cleveland. But I remember walking over to the swing and photographing this kid in this position because I wanted to show all the things that he's he had the 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 string of slavery, the history that he's holding on to, and what are his asking the question, what are his chances of leaving the Upward project? You, you know, there's a story about Jesse Owens and the Olympics. I know it well. Yeah, that um, Hitler gave all the so you tell that story, Rudy. I don't know. No, I don't. I don't know if it, we're, we're going to tell the same story. So you, you tell well, it. Well, uh, Hitler, all all the athletes or all the winners. I'm not sure if it was all the athletes or all the winners got seeds of a plant that came into a tree, and um, Owens won. I I don't know three or four medals at those Olympics. Four. Four. He won four, and he brought those seeds back. And there's a tree that still lives in Cleveland oh, from wow. those seedlings. So you imagine, you know, how wonderful that story is that no, Hitler you, had to no, give you, it to a black man. No, you're gonna make me go fi find that tree. Yeah, you you will. You should. That uh, it, it, I think it's near a school or a park. I'm gonna go find that tree. All right. There's your there's your homework, Rudy. There you go. Um, again, if you see a flag in my picture, it's always me questioning what is it that the African American hopes for by his loyalty to this flag. Um, there's this poem that I have up on Instagram called Black and Blue, and again, it's his relation. This kid spent some time in jail. When I met him, he had just come out and he was trying to work, uh, go through a work program in order to stay out of jail. Again, for me, an image, an image comprised of a poem and or a symbol that that vividly expresses what is in my head um i i talk about mental illness a lot and um i wanted to talk about this woman just walked up to me and asked me to read the, the back of that paper that's in her hand and it was it was just like a uh 
a puzzle. But I could tell that she had some issues and she was holding that glass in her hand. And I wondered, I kept asking her a question. And while I was asking her a question, she was talking with the with both things in her hand. And I held the camera and I waited because I saw that the light was playing in her face. And I just kept snapping while she was talking because I wanted to talk about what happens when something snaps in the mind or when something cracks in the mind. And this is what this, how this picture came out. And Rudy, do you make it a point to stay in contact with some of these folks? All the time. All oh. the time. All the time. I see this guy. This is from the Othwit project. They, If you look in the background, they were demolishing a part of the Othwit project. Um, and a lot of these guys were displaced. I see Henry all the time. At the, the There's only one place to buy food at Othwit, even though... The Othwaite housing project sits right in front of the warehouse that feeds Cleveland. There's a long chain of warehouses that feed Cleveland. But there's only a gas station that feeds the Othwaite housing project. Mm. Um, love, love to use shadow and reflection. Um, this woman lost both her sons to, to shootings by the police. Um, in like a three months, I did, it was a story for the New York Times. Um, but I like the reflection of the shadow above her face that looks like a, an inverted cross. And for me, a tragedy like this would rock your faith. And I wanted to put, because on her chest is the cross, which holds a rooter in her belief. But the tragedy shook her belief. And so when I saw the shadow, I was like, I, got, I have to make this picture. So Rudy, I mean, I, I can tell from you, you know, speaking to all your subjects, you must bring them a certain amount of inspiration, a certain amount of hope. And how does that play into, you know, these long-term relationships that you develop? Because they must see you and they must light up. You know, here's Rudy with his inspiration. I, th I think a big part of what happens with me and the people I collaborate with is the conversations we have. And the yeah. conversations that we continue to have, whether text, whether through DMs, whether through a phone call, it is, how are you? How are you feeling? How are you getting along? Um, are you working? Stuff like that. And it's amazing to know that there are people, there's Miss Tucker, who I photographed after Katrina, recently sent me a, a text just to ask how I was. Um, it, it was, a, and I, and I, I photographed, she used to work at the Waffle House, and I made an image of her and her husband. Her husband died three months after that picture. But we we have maintained a relationship over 12 years. And, and so for you, having these relationships is an, is an incredible responsibility because those folks are, are gravitating to you and they need you. I mean, in, in their own ways, right? I mean, they need, they see you, they, they need that. I mean, how do you own up to that responsibility? I, I'm, I, I grew up, I grew up in Jamaica where that's why I said the, the culture is so different. Like mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a, in a culture where I knew all my neighbors. I knew them from the top of the street to the bottom of the street. And if there's a connecting street, I knew everybody going around the street, everybody here in Cleveland and also in New York. I only knew the person in front of me, maybe the person beside me, maybe, or maybe two more people. I am accustomed to community. I'm accustomed to, to having a community come together, whether through Miss, Miss Farm Heights or, or Miss Montego Bay or a festival. Like we, we have festival functions where everybody, the whole community came out, harvest a church where all the community bring their harvest in. 
I'm accustomed to having these group, these community conversations. So for me, meeting people in a community type setting is completely normal. Mm. This is not normal for me. Mm. Like not being able to, to know my neighbors. So part, part of keeping these connections is therapeutic to you as well. It's a part of keeping community, yes. So both sides of the equation are 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 um, fulfilled. Yes. By this, they 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 feel hope that, and this is serious. Like I, there's a there's a story that I did in Mississippi with a doctor, Doctor Fakaredi, from Nigeria, from Jersey, could have stayed in New York, moved to Mississippi, and helps to to free people's blockages. Like normally you go to a hospital, the knee would be amputated. Mm. He helps to like put life back into that um, knee or, or leg or foot through his operations. Now we have continued to go back and forth. Like there's a, there's a statistics, five years after every amputation normally leads to death. And throughout the last three, four years, Dr. Fakaredi has kept up with me and all the people I photographed for the story. Already three people from that story have died. Wow. So it's it's kind of it's therapy for the both of us. Cause now we get to talk about it. We're, we 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 inspire each other again, like I can't drop this story. And he's like, I can't stop this work. And 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 there's kind there's kind of a, a renewed sense of purpose built into our conversation. It's very beautiful. I mean, how do you approach? I mean, what what's your technique? If it's a technique, or if it's just coming from your soul to ju just approach someone for their portrait. Um. Again, like uh, for me, there was it, it was about all the the police shootings and how could I make a street image that reflected that. And this was actually, he was standing there waiting for the bus. I just walked upon him um, with my camera. My camera is always here. I walked upon him and I kept shooting. I shot maybe 10 images before I got to this stance. He looked at me and I go, it's okay, man. I'm just making, a, I'm making an image. Do what you're doing. And he went back to, and I just photographed it. That's one. This image is completely different. I was in Milwaukee and I was on assignment and the assignment was not going well at all. And I happened upon this kid and he had on this t-shirt that says, Home of the Brave. And I was like, last image of the day, I'll just take it. And I went to the mall. It was, it, it was around the time when everybody was writing um, Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ matters or whatever it was. Everybody was putting it on a t-shirt. And I remember going to the mall and I put this picture on a t-shirt and I said, five, three, two, oh, six matters. And I wore the t-shirt the next day. And the whole day I was fine. Nobody said anything to me. And at the end of the day, I saw a group of people coming down the road and you get the feeling that they're coming for you. Like they were focused. You could see their eyes. And I remember backing myself into a garden and I was just like waiting, hoping that they would just pass. And they were like, no, bro, we're looking for you. I'm like, oh, what did I do? And the, 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 a woman stepped from the back and she steps around and she goes, where are you from? And I said, I'm from New York. And she goes, everybody in this community says, you have my son on your shirt saying 53206 matters. She said, nobody has ever done that before. Nobody cares about Milwaukee. Nobody cares about the worst zip code in America. And then she started to cry. And I was just like, you know, I just, I just, I saw the shirt and I thought it was the bravest thing because 53206 is the worst zip code in America. And he was wearing a shirt that says home of the brave. It mm. was a picture. And wow. for me, my mind is always thinking about imagery like this it is a conversation that's beautiful and again i'm stuck so maybe 
I don't know what happened. That's I mean it's not it's not flowing, but it's it's fine. I mean, I, I think that's it. I think that's yeah. my, my, my yeah. So, Rudy, you, you mentioned something about a, a book. You're trying to put together a book. Yes. Is that right? The book is when when living is a protest. Um, and I I I got the idea from a quote by Camus. Um, Camus said, Albert Camus, he said, when a soul has suffered it develops a taste for the misfortune. And it, for me, it aligned with the, this whole idea of who are the forgotten people? And I just wanted to be somebody to amplify these stories. Like, for, because for me, it wasn't about talking about their lives as it was talk, just having them tell me a story. Like, let me share your story. And that's what I, that's just something that I think I do with imagery. It's really just about sharing stories. In Haiti, there's this really famous storytelling scenario. It's called Creek Crack, where we all sit in a circle and I go creek and I tell a story and then I go crack and I call somebody's name and the person says, the, the next person goes, Ruddy Creek, and they tell their story. And I think that's that's the culture that I'm bringing here, this idea of, of amplifying these stories that wouldn't ordinarily be passed or ignored. Right. Well, Rudy, I mean, that was a terrific presentation. I hope you could stay around so that we can ask you more questions uh, afterwards. But uh, just to let you know, I mean, when you're ready with the book or you're trying to do a fundraiser, you, you reach out and we'll reach out to the network and see what, any way we could help you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. It was great. Next up is our friend Sarah Hoskins. Hello, I hope I'm here. Yes, you're here. We hear uh, you, we see you. All right, I'm going to try to get some photos up here. And um, for now, I am um, going to give you a little background. I am going to read a little bit uh, just because it takes me a little minute to get focused here on stuff. Um, thank you very much for including me. It's an honor to be here with everybody. Um, thank you to Critical Mass. And um, it's uh, an honor to be included in the top 50 and be able to share my work here. Um, for me, all of my projects come from someplace else. I mean, one thing will start and lead to another that leads to another, um, as was the case here with the home place. Um, so you got to kind of follow my path, which sometimes derails here. Um, in the 80s, um, in my 20s, um, late 80s, make myself a little younger, 89, I started photographing um, the rodeo just because I drove through Cheyenne on my way home from a trip. And, you know, I had like two bucks left and they said, oh, you should have been here last week for the rodeo. So I went and photographed the rodeo just because, you know, I grew up in Chicago and I didn't know what a rodeo really was like. And so from the rodeo, I went to horse racing. Um, I was hired by a racetrack in Chicago to photograph all the glamour and glitz that's the front side, but nobody ever really looked on the backside and knew about all the people who were living back there and working back there. Um, and that led me to Kentucky. Um, I tend to try and photograph people in places that you don't know, but should like the backside of the racetrack. And being in Kentucky, that led me to the work, The Home Place, which I've now been photographing for 23 years, um, which I never thought I'd be working on a project for 20 years. Um, the residents of the communities literally saved my life uh, and my daughters. They've become my friends and my family um, to the point that when we were able to, we moved here three years ago. Um, and it's now the place I call home. So I wanna give you a little bit of background on the history of these communities. Um, so in the decade after the Civil War, small African-American communities or settlements, there's been some debate on what they're called, sprang up around the horse farms in the inner bluegrass region, which is where this project is um, from. Uh, my work is a tribute to the residents of these communities, a salute to the elders who learned of slavery at their grandparents' need, knees, 
endured the Jim Crow South who lived separate but equal and saw the decades of milestones and their impacts, including desegregation, social segregation, the election of Barack Obama, the residents did much more than endure and survive negative circumstances. They rose above them and thrived. From the hopes and dreams of Obama to the newly installed security cameras of the churches, this is a story about survival in spite of everything. Um, my project is called The Home Place. Uh, the name comes from the Howard family home place, where each Sunday the family gathers after church as it has for decades. My work is a collaboration with the residents, and this was the name that everyone agreed on. Some people would call, call these historic places hamlets or villages or communities, but the home place was the name that everybody agreed on, and that was the name that has stuck and stayed. Um, I'm not a writer. I don't pretend to be a writer. Um, I've written statements about my work. Um, some have been criticized. A lot of them have been criticized. Um, but it's about stories. It's about stories. It's about relationships and the stories I've gathered over the years um, because it's not my story. I've done recordings of everybody, um, music. I've asked many of the seniors to, to write me notes um, about what their experiences were growing up here. And you know what, I'm just, you know, I'm a photographer. And um, so, that's what I do. I thought I would go to the Olympics, but Christy Hyde was faster. So I worked in the dark room starting in high school and worked at a drugstore and a grocery store and was supposed to go to the Art Institute of San Francisco, but that was too expensive. So I took the L and went what, to Columbia what, College. What was the event? Christy who? Christy Hyde was faster than me running the 440 relay. So I have yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that was our relay. So anyway, I was too slow to make the Olympics. So I had to have a career change at about 14 um, and ended up falling in love with photography when I was 17 because all my delinquent friends had graduated and I was alone in high school and took a darkroom class. And that kind of got me going. So this is a home place. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. Um so this is Otis Rankin. This photograph was um, taken in 2001 at the Maddox Town Baptist Church. Uh, it was the first time I'd gone to church there and I was leaving and I saw him sitting there and I just thought he was about the most regalist man I'd ever seen in my life. And over the years, uh, Pastor Travis and his wife, Billy, and a lot of the members, and we've all talked about it, I have never seen anybody sit there ever again so 22 years later so i don't know i thought he was pretty amazing um in 2005 a magazine that's now folded unfortunately which was called american legacy which was a magazine on the history and culture of african americans and when they ran the story on my work there, I went and I asked everybody, you know, is it okay if it's published and are, you know, we you give your approval. And I had a different picture of Otis and he's walking down the lane, going to church. And it was more like a clip because he was fast and he had passed away and had permission from his family. So when I got the, the order of these 250 magazines that thankfully American Legacy gave to me to mail out to the, to the communities, I looked at it first and the picture of Otis, not this one, the one where he's walking is next to a, a giant ad of Viagra. And I was like really mortified about this. And I called the pastor and I said, you know, I wasn't in charge of placement. I feel kind of awkward about this. And he said, it's okay, Sarah. He was quite a ladies man. Um, this is communion. This is Millward, Hank Gordon. Uh, I think I was the only one who called him Millward, but that was how I was introduced to him. And he's handing communion to Ms. Luvinia Banks. Uh, photographing in church gets difficult sometimes because you don't want to interrupt people's time and their prayers. And, you know, but I want to show the imagery because church is very often the soul of these communities. Um, it's where I sometimes usually go first if it's a new one. Um, and, you know, I always, you know, I'll stand up in church and have to introduce myself. And 
when my daughter graduated high school, I had four women from the communities come because they really are her family and my family. So they were there at her high school graduation or college graduation. Mary Talbert looked at me where, you know, Emma went to school. It was my daughter. And it was a pretty white school. You know, it was not my first choice because I grew up in a very integrated neighborhood, primarily in a black community. And so Mary whispers to me at the graduation, not a whole lot of black folks here. I was like, kind of like me going to church with you, isn't it? So, you know, anyway, there's my story. And, and Sarah, do, do you have contact with these folks, you know, currently? Um, I spent Thanksgiving with the Travis family. Um, Millward, I was asked to photograph his funeral by his daughter. I I moved here. I moved here. So um, the answer would be yes. Yeah. Yeah. 2012, my daughter and I um, were driving to, I was to give a lecture at Tuskegee University in Alabama, and we were in a car accident in Pulaski County, Kentucky, which I would not recommend driving through to anybody, um, nor would I recommend, you know, well, put it this way, when we were in the car accident, my daughter called Billy Travis, whose husband was a pastor of this church, and or I talked to her. I had a concussion and collapsed lung, and this is a long story. But the long and the short of it is, I said, you need to come get me out of here because the doctor, doctor smells like alcohol and he's going to kill us. And they drove in the pouring rain, 120 miles, got my daughter, got my cameras, got me film, got me medevac back to the University of Kentucky where Derek Talbert, um, I don't have a photograph of Derek in this group, was waiting for me. And and they said, and how do you know her? And he said, it's a long story. So the answer to that question is, um, yeah, a little bit. Beautiful. This is Reverend Lyle Morton. This is in uh, the Boydtown Church. He was from the community in New Zion, and he pastored two churches um, at that time. Um, Boydtown Church didn't have a lot of members. I think there might've been four at the time and we'd gone up there for the day. I think he's on his cell phone. He's since moved to Virginia. And I, I talked to him and his wife uh, three days ago um, and this church was torn down, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So which, Sarah, can you speak to how it goes from shooting subjects to building friendships? and relationships like how does is that does that just happen organically for you or you know like, can, can you give us a sense of that well it's it's birthday cards it's christmas cards it's it's phone calls i everybody has a photograph of right. themselves um it's a good thing and a bad thing because Recently, there's been a lot of people passing away, and a lot of my images taken from one point or another have been used in ongoing services, obituaries. And if you think about it, how do you want to be remembered? If somebody asked you to use a photograph of them on how to be remembered, I don't know. I don't think you can really do any better than that, you know? Yeah, that's pretty intense. Uncle Joe... Edwards, he passed away, and I wasn't able to go to the funeral because my mother-in-law had passed away. But they called and they asked for photographs for me to send them. So I mean, I don't, you know, relate. It's it's relationships. I mean, I commuted for twenty years. It, you know, five and a half to seven hours, depending on you know if I was driving, my husband driving, my daughters were driving because I tended to drive a little fast through Indiana. I know I can tell you all the. Uh, police hangout um because i have been pulled over only once 150 dollars um it's it's you just you communicate you show up when you're supposed to you know? and they're there for you when they're supposed to it's it's remembering i have a i have a list of names that's printed out um and it's it's in the order of how i've met people and their birthdays are listed so, you know, and I don't always remember, but, you know, I, I give back photographs, I mean, to everybody. Um, I went to a community 
two years ago and the pastor had died at the church and I didn't know anybody was left. And I'm sorry, I don't have that image with this group. And um, so there was a guy named Bobby Hart and I walked down there and he is now 93 years old. And he said to me, I remember you. He said, you mailed me that picture back. I was on the Creek. And I, and I said, yep, Mr. Hart. I said, it was a Saturday and you were vacuuming the church. I yeah. don't know. No, that, that is such a beautiful story. And, and, you know, it's something for young people, young photographers in any, or, or young people just in general to take these kinds of notes and build these relationships. Like you said, it's a simple birthday card, something to remember. And that's how, you know, whether it's personal relationships or business relationships, that's the way they're cultivated, you know, one at a time. You know, and it's kind of a weird segue. And this happened, I think, a couple of years ago. And Reverend Raglan, um, my friend, Panisa's father, I'd gone to visit him. And I always mail Christmas cards. And, and I've had friends say, why do you do this? I mean, I, I do one for like clients, which is, you know, the client card, you know, give me work. Very um, small. And um one, I remember somebody was like, that is so stupid. And then somebody else hung it on their door. I've gotten work. But anyway, Reverend Raglan every year, and I've done this for years. My daughter's 28 years old. She started working on the project with me when she was five. Yeah. And I have sent a postcard of her. And we've always had the lab retriever dogs. So I always send a picture with her and their dogs. And Reverend Raglan had them all in a little book. He'd saved them all. Wow. And that was just so wonderful. Except for Miss Clara Jackson, who was 103, said to me one year, Dang, Sarah, that dog sure is old in that picture. I said, Clara, not everybody lives to be 104. That's like the third <laughs> dog. Anyway, sorry. Segwaying uh, off. It's a beautiful story. Good. Glad you uh, shared that. So this is Reverend Morton um, in Boydtown. And sure. this is um, Hawk Beatty and Miss Ruth Beatty. And Ms. Ruth passed in 2022, and this image was used at her homegoing service, and um, which was very much of an honor. And I made prints for as many as I could because they have such a, such a large family. Hawk Beatty, um, and he's not about to punch me with the clenched fist. Actually, he had just had a stroke. He was from a family of 17 children, and. When I met them, there were four surviving brothers still alive, and they all had nicknames, Hawk, Big Devil, Walker Boy, and Bunny. And uh, my, my daughter thought it was really great to be able to call a grown man Bunny. And what uh, year is this, Sarah? It was, 2000 and, it was 2002, 2003. It was like December. So oh, it was December. So That is a beautiful print. My God. Thank you. And in all my work is done in black and white film. This is the only project that I still do in black and white film because I want to stay consistent. It's unfortunately extremely expensive. I'm years and years and years and years and years behind printing because, because of it. And it's expensive to do, but first and foremost, my goal has to make the images um, because of my concern of things passing and things disappearing which unfortunately they have um like a lot of the seniors um and that's 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 getting very hard because i find myself going to more home goings um than homecomings and i'm not gonna lie you know i mean i hope i can get through it without crying because they are my friends and my family and so, you know i'm sorry home, go ahead no no home goings are funerals funeral. right okay i have i've never heard that term Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so this is Hawk and Miss Ruth. This is, and this is very early on. And they were the first, they were the first people to invite me home um, after church for Sunday supper. And it was the beginning of my weight gain. Um, because when my dad was a Chicago public school teacher, macaroni and cheese was a main course in the summer because they didn't get paid. And here, macaroni and cheese is a side dish. So there. anyway, um, this is the Sisters Benevolent, um, their 99th year, because it was the 99th year that they had been in existence. And this is this is my, this is my friend, my very, very dear friend, Mrs. French's home. And she is not in the picture, 
Um, she was very angry with me because she was not in the picture. She was in the kitchen making food because they were held the first Thursday of every month at different people's houses. And so she was in charge of the luncheon. And I, I love Mrs. French, love Mrs. French. And I, and I used to give her a real hard time because anybody knew who knew Mrs. French knew that she collected giraffes. And if you look, I'm pointing in the window. I don't know if you can see it, but she's got giraffes in there. So I always said, everybody knows this is your home. You're there. The giraffes are there. And, and when she passed um, away, her family later on said uh, everybody could come over and pick one of her giraffes um, to have. And I have a little wooden giraffe that's uh, in my kitchen window ledge. So she's, I see her kind of every morning. So this is, this is for Mrs. French, Miss Virginia French. And she's like one of the only people I call Mrs. French um, and uh, out of respect. And when I first met her, it was, I was interviewed. I thought that I was going to interview all the sisters. There were six of the Howard sisters still alive. I was not doing the interviewing. They were doing the interrogation. So she stayed Mrs. French and I, I miss her. Um, this is her sister, Miss Princess Spencer, um, collecting dues at the sisters meeting. And, um, my daughter always knew when we got a letter, um, from one of, especially the seniors, um, from Kentucky, because it would always be beautifully handwritten in this beautiful script, which you can see, um, in the ledger here with princess's handwriting. My daughter would come in she'd say, we got a, we got a letter from Kentucky today. And she was always right because the handwriting is so beautiful. And uh, Emma, right? Emma's your daughter? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she embraced all of this. And I mean, how does she look at you as you're going through this journey? I made her sit in the car a lot. And then when she got, then when she got old enough to drive, she drove a lot. Um, she grew, she grew up doing it. I mean, she started coming down when she was five years old. Her college essay, her college essay for her entrance exam, and it, it's it's one of my favorite lines. She wrote, "I learned about Black history on floral couches." Wow. Yeah, not bad. Wow, that's yeah. I'm glad yeah. I asked that question. I'm really she's, glad. She's twenty eight. Twenty eight now. So beautiful. Um, I I think she enjoyed it. I do. Um, she grew up within it. Um, I think her life is broader from it. I think she certainly learned a lot, especially patience sitting in a car. Um, and then as she got older, she's the one who did all the recordings for me and, you know, worked, worked the machine. And she used to make these little books, um, about Kentucky and she, she would write about it and she's, she's written about the images I made her do. Well, I didn't make, well, yeah, you know, I, I kind of made her do it. Um, and I asked her to, to write about the images because in the proof sheets, you know, remember that where's Waldo, you know, find where's, where's Waldo every now and again, you can see her like running through the picture or ducking in church. So she wouldn't be this like little white face in the background of church or, you know, she's in a tobacco wagon or running through, you know, with the faces tobacco fields. So, and then I would circle her with a big marker. Look, yeah. look what you've done. No, kidding. Yep. Not really. Um, this is tobacco. Um, and this is one of the things that is pretty much gone since I first began. Uh, this is D. Spencer on the left, Lewis Burton, and um, Jean Brown, Lewis Burton. There you go. D. Spencer, Lewis Brown, Jean Brown. I think I got that right. Jean Brown. Anyway, you know what I mean. Anyway, D. Spencer. <laughs> Um, called me and he he said we're going to plant tobacco for the last time if you want to come and um, he knew I would come down and do it so he called and he was he was pretty funny because I remember him meeting me out on the lane and he was waiting for me and I really pretty much could dime, dime it you know when I arrived unless I got pulled over so people began to know what I wanted to do and show um, if things were going to unfortunately fade away. So I was lucky enough that D called me and picked up the phone and I went down and I photographed him 
getting ready to plant the last time. Wow. Um, this is Mr. Winston Figs. Um, this is 2001. Um, and he was, he was the last one period to plant tobacco. And, and that's he, his farm. Yep. Yep. And in, in what Winston said to me, which I feel, feel is, is really important. And, um, he said uh, that tobacco put most black children through college, and I and I know it did his son, um, Greg, um, who I believe became the superintendent. Um, he was he was he was a big fish in the school system. So, um, you know, he was he was the last one to do tobacco. And he passed um, right after his 90th birthday during COVID. And um, his granddaughter called me and asked if they could use the photos of him and the tobacco and they're in his home going program. So they put together this little piece and they didn't want people really to come because they were too afraid that people were going to get sick and they were going to get COVID. And that was really, really hard is when you, you couldn't go to these. Um, and they were trying to protect people because you can't help but hug people. Um, you just, you can't at that time. So anyway, that, that was an honor. And, and, and Winston was, he was, he was good and he could sing. So good his son. This is housing tobacco. Um, I don't know what it is about housing tobacco that it always has to be hot. This is Ronald, Ronald Ronnie Howard, you know, depending on which name, but Ronald Howard. And I think it must have been 104 degrees that day. And in climbing up there, I, you, you can't imagine. I mean, it was just ridiculously hot. So this is like he's up on the third, the third level housing tobacco. And it's I mean, it's done. I mean, Winston, Winston was the last. And this D, D Spencer, I think, was um called me and when we, we went and housed this. Um, I want to read something now because I think it's, a, I wrote it a long time ago and I want people to understand um, why I did this. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you know, um, this might upset you. These are only three pictures from um, the series of work. So I got to put on my glasses here because I'm old. Um, hog killing. I suppose people might say hog killing how barbaric and the thing i remember most from that night is a gentle voice let go piggy let go come on piggy let go Co coaxing a hog to die how i was allowed into this group i still do not know it seemed a club to me all these men working as a team probably not talking as much as they normally would have since i was there me a strange white woman from the city there to photograph most having no idea why i'd come my idea of why I'd come changed that night too. I came to record hog killings to show something that was probably going to pass and fade away as the old man passed, never knowing if their sons would carry on the traditions of their father. What I found was a group of men, a sort of a secret world. I saw men working together as I'd never seen before, and I don't think I will ever again. In a barn on a cold February night, it wasn't death I felt and saw. It was the life of these men and a gentle soul coaxing a pig to die. Um, nobody really does this anymore. Um, the old man did pass. Um, my dear, dear friend, Uncle Ernest, um, as well as one of his sons, Leroy, who's with the gun there, has also passed away. And when Uncle Ernest died um, and his home going was held in the community church, the lines went out the door. Um, I mean, they went out the door down the lane and um, my husband and daughter and I were standing, you know, in the back, you know, past the nieces and nephews. And one of his grandchildren um, came and got me and uh, walked me to the front of the line and said, uh, walked me to the front of his line, front of the line. And his daughter, Laferne, said to me, Daddy would have wanted you to sit with us um, because he loved you. You know, so when you say and you ask if things are about relationships, it is pretty, pretty close. Um, and I actually almost stopped this project in 2007. Um, 
uh, when Uncle Ernest died, just because it was just too hard. Winston Figgs was his best friend and they lived, you know, like two lanes away and Winston wouldn't even drive by his house. Um, but I, I kept going kind of because of him, um, because the photos of the hog killing um, had been published. Um, we did an online music piece in 2003 um, was a magazine called photo eight. And he was so proud of that. Um, he's like, they heard me in London and everywhere. And when his photo appeared at American legacy, he would drive around with the magazine in his truck. And I'd made him a book of all the photos um, of the hog killing. And he would come out with me and take pictures. Um, he had this way of saying my name and he would be like, Sarah, where are we going to go today? And, you know, so anyway, this is hog killing. So um, it was important, you know, and, and people, they're not doing it very much anymore. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, did you feel apprehension to, apprehensive to shoot it? It was not easy. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I had I had never met Uncle Ernest until the day that I walked in that barn. His his son Derek called me. It was a weird Tuesday. He said, "Daddy's killing hogs tomorrow night if you want to come." And uh, got there and went. And it wasn't easy to shoot. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I was Leroy and I used to laugh and laughed after this because when I walked in that bar, he looked at barn. He looked at me and he said, "We're here to work." And it was like, who are you? And and then afterwards, we kind of chuckled because I'm standing on a, a table, right? So I'm standing on a wooden table that is so slick that you can imagine I have these big boots on. And I'm standing over this tub of hot lye. And Leroy and I used to joke, things would have gone a lot different if I had fallen in that tub. Um, and this group of images used to be at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. They had them in their print room for a little while. And Uncle Ernest and Derek came up and were able to see them. And that was, that was when people ask what some of your best moments are, that was, that was about one of mine. Yeah. Um, and this is Uncle Joe, this is sharpening knives the next day. So like a lot of the, the night before the younger men did all the heavy lifting of the work, I mean, there were 13 hogs killed in three hours. I mean, it was crazy. It wasn't easy to shoot, but I think it's some of the best work I've done. It's in the Smithsonian. I mean, I'm known for that, which is kind of a strange thing to be known for. But it's it's important. It's yeah. it's it's history. And so much of it's gone. There was an interview on NPR, and it was a it was a man saying, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to kill hogs, not with climate change. And there was an old quote, and it used to be, there has to be frost in the ground to kill hogs. After I did this, I learned my grandfather killed hogs in upstate New York. They were like poor farmers. So, I don't know. Things are strange, I guess. No. You, so you, you have to pull back the curtain, right, you know, to, to see. I mean, we, we want to see. Um. So, needless to say, I had to eat barbecue. So... Uh -huh. This is um, at the Talbert family reunion. This is my first reunion I went to. I think it was in 2003. This is Margaret Tangsley. Um, I don't know what it was in the Talbert household with this aluminum foil because it was about the thickest foil ever known to man. See, and you can understand some of my weight gain process here. This is Miss Lydia. Talbert, this is Uncle Ernest's mother. This is the first photo I made of anybody, um, period, before Otis Rankin. This is in two, 2001, 2000, 2000, 2000, 2001. And uh, she, um, no, I take that back. This was this was family reunion. She was 100. I photographed her the first time when she was 94. So this is 2006, forgive me on that. Um, but she was she was a hundred in this. I don't know what she was drinking, but I think we all need some. Um, I included this just because I think it's funny um, image because this is Reverend Hunter Bird, and I was in his bedroom. Didn't have a very big house, and he, he was on the phone, and um, he's like, "Well, that white lady's here again, and she's gained some weight." 
And I, I, I called, I went and saw Lennis Beatty, uh, who was related to Miss, Miss Ruth Beatty, who you saw early on. She said, oh, don't worry, honey. She says, he says that everybody's gained weight. Cause so anyway, it wasn't just me, but I thought it was a funny story. And I did gain weight. Yeah. Mr. Jackson this is the fourth spring after, after Sunday meals on the front porch, him and his son. Um, sometimes this is a, a harder image for me to look at because um, Miss Juanita had had gotten so frail and was so thin. I have another picture of her and her husband, Kat, on their front porch. But I love it because this is about the communities. Some of her sons are back there. Everybody's looking out for everybody. And I just like, I know they're looking out for her. They looked out for me. Um, still do. This is Zion Hill Days, community celebration. Another weight gain. This is Reverend Raglan. There are a lot of Reverend Raglans. All of them could sing too. Uh, Zion Hill Days. I just like the little kids running behind him. And I just like how he's just pressed. Um, I call this new car, new Zion. Um, Cause there is always a new car out in front of this house always. And a few months ago I went back and the house is now gone, but there's still kind of a new car out there. Um, I like to close out with a couple things when I um, do my lectures and I want to read something um, that was written 15 years ago. Um, and it's one of the statements I think I'm most proud of. Um, this is Reverend Travers wrote this for me as a reference for a Guggenheim letter uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I did not get the Guggenheim. Um, and I'm sure that my letter might have been a little bit out of the box for them. Um, but in the end, for it, um, you know, money certainly would help and a Guggenheim would look real prestigious. But as I tell my students, I've done a lot of programs over the years with women's shelters and troubled kids, or I, I don't like troubled kids. I would really say neglected kids, kids who don't art programs. Um, I always tell them the re reward is in the doing, um, but it's also in receiving. So this was written um, a long time, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and this, this was my letter from my Guggenheim reference. Her presence in our communities over the past eight years has renewed pride in the old hamlets. She is well known and received by the older members of the communities who are often very skeptical when visitors show up, but yet have been revitalized because someone is taking the time to show sincere interest and concern for them. I only wish I could fully express the importance of her work and what it means to all of us from Maddox Town to Jimtown, from New Zion to New Vine, from Uttinger Town to Peyton Town, from Bracktown to Caden Town, to name a few. She's made good friends who eagerly anticipate her arrival each time she ventures from Chicago, Illinois. As a result, she has compiled a list of names, friends given her by local residents that is quite extensive, and she manages to keep in contact with many of us by phone. She is so highly favored because she did not come to take away from us like so many do, but unknowingly, she has restored a sense of pride once again in our African-American heritage, Reverend John Carroll Travis. Um, well, I always close um, with this image and a little bit of music. Um, this was taken 2003, 2002, 2003. Um, and this is the Jimtown Mill Chorus. And I was really, really late getting back to Chicago um, because it was a home homecoming that day and they were getting ready to go in the church. And I, I really couldn't stay because it was like six o'clock and it was a six hour drive back. Um, so this is the first year there and I'm taking the picture and I just think they look so pressed and dressed. And I knew that they could sing. I mean, everybody in the area, Jimtown Mill Chorus, boom. They, they can sure sing, you know, I was kidding once to somebody said, yeah, I was, I was out listening to the Jimtown Mill Chorus, you know, they can't sing at all. And the guy's looking at me like he, I was crazy. And then he's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I heard him not singing just the other day. Um, so I asked him if they'd sing me a song 
And you have to forgive the quality of this tape because this is like, you know, one of those really crummy portable tape recorders. Um, but I asked them to sing for me and um, they did. And uh, sometimes the reward is something like this. <laughs> Anyway, you you get the idea. You can hear my my camera and oh, nice. uh, yeah. Most most of these men have men have passed, um, right. and that's 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 the hard thing. Um, but hopefully, you know, I can share the work, share the stories, and share the music. And um, yeah, that's, Sarah, that's it. The, yeah, that's beautiful. Sarah, do you sell prints? Mm, I yeah, there's some in some museums have purchased some hospitals. I mean, you know, right now I'm figuring out where where to place the work that's okay. good outlive us all and be able to tell the stories and of the communities. I mean, you know, most of my stuff I I give to the residents. I mean, I print I print it all. I mean, I'm not going to say I haven't sold it. I I have. It's in some collections um, mm -hmm. that sure. I'm proud of. Um, they had an exhibit at, at the hospital here where I actually was in my car accident, and the hospital purchased some. And I got to say, I really like having my work there. Um, a lot of the residents called. Um, because they were there and they saw it. And I think that art can be healing. And 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 that that was really pretty wonderful to get a lot of those calls. Miss Juanita, who had passed and was so thin, there was a picture of her and her her uh, husband there, and her daughter called me up and said, you know, I saw I saw that. So okay, great. Well, I, I hope. I, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming in and presenting. I hope you can stay so we have some questions well, later on. Sure. Um that would be that would be great. Um so next up is um our friend Daniel. So Daniel will get uh Sarah to stop sharing. Stop and sharing. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. There you go. Great. Um Daniel Sackman, it, it's all yours. Oh you. great. Okay, so uh, sorry, just give me a second. Okay, you do go. you see an image? We just see unseen. Great. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, thank you, uh, Frank and Polly, and and a big thank you to Critical Mass um, for allowing me to here tonight it's really an honor and, and especially following on the heels of seeing Rudy and Sarah's work it's that's really beautiful and really emotional and mine is nothing like that <laughs> so uh, everyone is in for a surprise in that regard but um uh, unseen which is the name of my project may may not be conventionally documentary and and I wouldn't classify it either as conventional street photography. Um, it's more conceptual and vision, but that said, I, I still consider it, um, you know, to be narrative. So to go way, way back to the beginning, as a kid, I had terrible nightmares. I was terrified of the dark. And, you know, I was one of those kids who went to sleep with a flashlight to ward off whatever might be lurking under my bed or in the dark recesses of, of my closet. Um, hold on a second, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and fortunately I grew out of that uh, fear by and replacing it with, uh, you know, an adult fascination my overactive imagination, which is still with me, though sort of channeled it into kind of a fascination of 
you know, what secrets were hidden in these dark places. Um, I've been a director and producer of film and television for over three decades. And though I have always had this love of photography, I'm honestly mystified that this long ingestation process and project actually has made, made it into a critical mass still kind of blows my mind. Um, I'm going to endeavor to be as succinct as possible, but I hope you'll bear with me um, in that uh, bringing this project to light after 10 years, uh, I need to provide a little bit of backstory to give it a sense of uh, context. Um, you know, in school, I was a C average student with a sub average attention span. I was stubborn and was not good about taking no for an answer. And this is probably the only explanation I can offer as to why a respected dean of college admissions would admit someone with a zero aptitude for engineering degree into their school of engineering. Um, So, um, after flunking out of college, uh, I had this insane idea that maybe I would be uh, better suited for uh, something in the, a career in the arts. And around this time, I happened to make this acquaintance of a woman that would change the direction of my life forever. She was a 86 year old semi retired film editor by the name of Margaret Booth. Mm. And that's Margaret back then. Um, she was this uh, unbelievable film editor that during the had worked during the golden years at MGM Studios. She had been Irving Thalberg's right-hand person. She had uh, broken the glass ceiling when people didn't know what a glass ceiling was and had cut over 60 feature films, um, including a Mutiny on the Bounty. And she was considered Hollywood royalty. And for reasons that uh, are still not clear to me, she took a, a liking to me and she offered me this position as an apprentice film editor on this next project of hers. This is her back in the day um, when uh, like in the 19, late 1920s. Um, so uh, I just need to give um, uh, a little bit of explanation of, 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 uh, sorry, uh, of, of working with Margaret. My first week on the job was spent holed up in a studio screening room. Volume set at 11 as Margaret was hard of hearing and was uh, vain about admitting it. We were screening all of John Huston's films for this AFI retrospective that Margaret was editing. So 30 movies in a week, one after the next, me not sort of hip to the lingo of, of editing yet, and her, uh, you know, yelling, uh, shouting these uh, 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 notes to me in my general direction, me struggling to, to write them down. Uh, but we got to these two movies that John Houston had done, The Maltese Falcon and The Asphalt Jungle. I'd never seen them before. I was like moderately familiar with his work, but it was kind of revelatory for me. I, cause I had really never sort of seen anything like that. And that was sort of the beginning of my embracing of film war. Well, so just one more moment to give me that a little context as well. Uh, you know, back in the, uh, in the mid forties, uh, through about 1958, the studio started pumping out these cheap thrillers, B movies, 
as a way of satisfying this growing demand for filmed entertainment as people just come back from the war. And much of the material was adapted from these dime store detective novels, popular in the 30s and 40s, but was what was different about noir and what I found fascinating was this emphasis on the psychology of the characters originating as it did following World War II, noir was this kind of time-based phenomenon and it exploited this growing sense of disillusionment and, and cynicism and, you know, uh, not really the time to dig into it here, but it was something that um, um, the this entire idea of the femme fatale was based on these men getting Dear John letters or fearful of their wives had not been faithful to them when they came back. And so it, it's, it's really, it's like the first art form that really was uh, inspired by what was happening in real life at the time. Uh, anyway, the, the process of, of editing for me, it opened my eyes that the power that even a, a single image could hold within a bigger visual narrative. Um, I also learned about the tools and the techniques that directors and cinematographers employ when creating an image to evoke or I guess manipulate uh, the desired reaction or emotion or response from the viewer. Daniel, how old are you when this is all happening? I'm like 24. Wow. Okay. Young, like really young. Like, uh, but it was it, it was just this uh, uh, it was this amazing film school, um, and as it served as this film school, uh, and I moved on from being this apprentice to an assistant to an editor and working on these big movies, uh, and then I segued into television where I began to edit. But at a certain point, I segued into the role of a producer and then a director. And and the, probably the only reason this is relevant is for the fact that I, I was someone, I'm an introvert, and I had gotten used to working in a dark room by myself, which I sort of relished. And being a producer, being a director, it's, uh, uh, it's a job that involves a... Uh, a lot of collaboration. Um, collaboration is sort of the oxygen that drives television. And uh, as much as I got a chance to work with these really talented artists, uh, cinematographers and production designers, um, and, and you can't really achieve success in television because of its tight schedules uh, and its tighter budgets, Without that collaboration, it, even the best collaboration can, after a fashion, become stifling. You desire to create something of your own and without all of the constrictions and the restrictions and the constant conversations about art versus commerce. Anyway, in 2008, the Writers Guild of America went out on strike. Think of it kind of like the prequel to the 155 day strike that we just went through. And uh, as much like this time, it brought all of Hollywood to this, Hollywood film production to a grinding halt. And this also coincided with the first kind of uh, professional quality digital cameras that had become affordable. And so I bought a camera and I went back to school. And much like the first time, I somehow talked the people into the Art Center College of Design into allowing me into the photography, uh, into their photography department. Um, you know, I had been uh, been directing for a while and, and I felt pretty successful at knowing, understanding composition and, and how to craft images. And um, yet I, I couldn't, I didn't take a good picture for four years. 
it's certainly nothing I would consider successful. Uh, technically proficient, maybe, but lacking drama, lacking emotion. Um, and I was really close to hanging it up when a photographer friend of mine suggested we take this day trip out to the Salton Sea. Uh, for those who don't know it, it's this very kind of bizarre uh, community that used to be a tourist destination in California until the lake bed dried up, the fish died, there were these noxious fumes and about 90% of the population just moved, leaving these empty homes and trailers. And it's this kind of, you know, surreal place. Um, that uh, is the Salton Sea. Uh, anyway, uh, I must've shot over 600 photos on that day and didn't capture a single memorable frame. Um, and on the long drive home, while I was contemplating tossing my camera into the ocean, so never having to look at it again, um, uh, I end up looking off in the distance. It's sunset and there's this kind of extraordinary event. Uh, I grab my camera and tell my friend to veer down the center of the highway. Um, I shot this image. And, and this was the first image that I had, this was the first image that I had taken in four years that I had any real pride in. And it struck me that I had sort of discovered something only I really wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it had something to do with mystery and emotion. And, uh, but I didn't know where it was going to take me. So I titled it Destination Unknown. And um, so uh, I kind of knew where I was going partly. Uh, I didn't take another good picture for another two years. So I'm now up to like six years and uh, I, it's 2014, I'm attending this photography workshop in Tokyo. And one night while we're exploring these windy back streets of Shinjuku, I come upon this small cluster of these kind of old, very old classic noodle shops, and many of whom catered to these kind of ubiquitous, uh, suited salary men of Tokyo. Um, and uh, that's when I spotted this. So, so wait, Daniel, how do you go you know, from someone who's being introverted, right? And then you all of a sudden have to collaborate. And then you don't take a photograph, for, you know, two photographs in six years that you like. What, what ke you know, kept you in it? What yeah, was, uh, was, I am, um, I think probably uh, the fact that I had been successful at one thing and I couldn't quite figure out what was preventing me from being successful at this. Um, and I just, I'm like a dog with a bone. I just, it's hard for me to give up. Yeah. And I, and I was also looking to do this, a, a personal project and I just couldn't lock into what it was. Um, but when I shot this, I had this really visceral reaction and it brought me back to that day, 20 years before that I spoke about where I was sitting with Margaret Booth in that screening room. And up on the screen starts to unspool the asphalt jungle and um, the Maltese Falcon. And the, the re reaction I had to them, and, and then it, it hit me that the answer sort of lied between my childhood and that moment in terms of wanting to tell a narrative that spoke to mystery and, and, and cynicism. And, um, and I felt like that kind of unlocked the door for me. And so, um, so you, so you take this image and as you're taking this image, do you recognize this is a moment? Yeah. I did. Wow. I mean, especially after shooting thousands of photos that no one's ever seen that they're just sitting uh, on a dusty hard drive somewhere. Mm. Um, so that takes me a little bit to the to the aesthetic. Um, 
what I sort of realized in the, in, in the moment was what I had been missing, I guess, which is part of the answer to your question is I had been missing intention and intention. I guess in, in film, you would call it a point of view, walking with a point of view. And what I was missing in my photography was an intention. What was I trying to get? I was just taking pictures, looking for beautiful things, but uh, what it was lacking was this um, uh, uh, sense of specific purpose. It was vague. Um, and to give you sort of a, a, a compliment to that in, in directing, you know, uh, I learned early on that when you give an acting note to an actor, it, if it doesn't have intention, if it doesn't have point of view, it's sort of pointless. If you said your character is angry, you wouldn't tend to get a satisfying result because it's not active, it's an idea. Um, because there are a thousand ways to manifest anger. But if you said to, some, said to them something like, you're angry, so you're going to punish them, um, or uh, you're gonna give them the silent treatment, or you're going to be sarcastic. Those are all different ways to manifest anger in a fight. And I, what I came to understand was I needed to do the same with photography. I needed to, if, if it was a, if it was a, a location, I would go to the location and I would wait for something to happen, and I would be looking for a very a, a specific event, a specific emotion. But I knew that I wanted to capture some wander lost or I wanted to capture anxiety or I wanted to capture mystery it, it needed to be specific which is one of the reasons why it I think took me so long to catch on to it and why you know if I shoot a good photo in a month I'm I'm lucky uh so, so, do you feel, so Daniel do you feel that you I mean at some point were burdened by your intellectual um entry into this that it it, it it seems so intense for you yeah to come up with something i i think you're right i mean i i think that you know it, it's sort of like unlearning a bad habit mm. right um and i was cocky i mean look i i, I do believe that that i believe in this sort of ten thousand hour rule that um it's his name um the author of The Tipping Point, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about in this book, Outliers. And, and one of the things he says is it takes 10,000 hours to get to master anything. And I honestly believe that. And, and I had put in those 10,000 hours in a different field and what I didn't really realize that this was, uh, this was really different. Mm. Um, so... Uh, the next stage was to figure out, well, as part of this, like, where do I shoot this? And I initially started shooting the series locations, which evoked a, kind of a bygone era. Because I had this feeling that, you know, when you look at a photograph that was shot by any of these great masters, and, and I acknowledge that they're great photos, but there's something about them that feels, it, it's sort of romantic and nostalgic. And the truth is, it is in part because we're looking at a bygone era. You know, photographs, they become more interesting and more intriguing with time, unlike a painting, say. And so I was looking to see if I could create kind of that feeling, but in a contemporary photograph by choosing environments that were um, reminiscent of that, you know, places that sort of like time capsules, right? Reflecting changes in architecture, fashion, and society that had that element of nostalgia about them. Um, and eventually it came down to finding locations which evoked this, a sense of collective memory, which helped create uh a kind of a testament to the dynamic nature of time and change. Time also being something that is a, a subject that's always been fascinating to me because having ADHD, 
uh, I am sort of like time blind. Um, a lot of the creative choices that I made or, or make, uh, I, I couldn't tell you if they are, if they made them consciously or unconsciously. But the other thing that I, I, I realized is that I, I, I started to look for not just, you know, light and darkness. I was looking for a way to sort of guide the eye towards light as opposed to a dark frame that, that had elements of light. It was about finding the light buried inside it, which again, it was sort of more reminiscent of this kind of fascination that came out of my, my childhood. Um, Anyway, the objective was to allow the light to serve as this kind of proverbial North Star um, uh, uh, that would uh, hopefully draw the viewer's interest and 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 add a sense of sort of mystery to it. Um, it, it Daniel, <clears throat> as you're shooting or after you come back from a shoot, how satisfied are you usually? I'm really satisfied if I get an image that I love it, but you know, I'm, I think you can tell I'm sort of, I'm hard on myself. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I guess that sort of speaks to process, right? Um, I, I'm really very meticulous. I shoot in a, probably in, in a different way, but, but this it probably comes from my experience from years of, of producing and directing in that, Unlike sort of typically going out on the street and you bring a camera like a, 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 as I do it when I'm shooting sort of more conventional street photography, um, uh, I tend to go out and I, I find the location. I do light studies because I want to know what the light is going to do at various times of the day. And then I'll go back and I might spend an hour or two hours in a location. Um, and it wouldn't be unusual for me to go back and do it time and time and time again, two times, three, four, five, as many as like a half a dozen times that I've gone back to the same location before I've ended up with something that sort of speaks to me. Um, because there's, no matter what you do, no matter how much you plan, right? Whether And whether you're shooting a movie or, or shooting a photograph or you're doing it in a conventional sense, if you're doing it the way Sarah does it or Rudy does it, you're looking for a kind of magic and you don't really know until you have it. Um, and that magic might be uh, uh, here where I was trying to create a sense of sort of voyeurism and, and, you know, tension by virtue of feeling as if it's someone watching. And again, that that harkens back to the inspiration that I took from um, uh, these movies, um, uh, you know, noir films. Uh, or it was about confinement um, uh, as a theme. So it would always be about going out with the intention of capturing a theme um, as opposed to just going out and trying to find a, a photo that I liked. Mm. Um, or it could be about disorder uh, or it could be about atmosphere or it could be about mood um, but there was always an idea behind it. Um, anyway, uh, I've been, you know, evolving the project now, and hopefully it's getting down to the end. Um, we started a couple of other projects, and I'm I'm working on turning this into a book. Um, but so, so Daniel, uh, with, with with the intensity that you shoot with. And you say you have another project and another project. Those things take a long time for you. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, do you do you um, do you get pressured by timelines? Do you get pressured by I got to move on from this? Like, how do you know when it's over? How do you start something new? 
what you know because you, th there must be such I, I I don't want to use the word turmoil but you know like to get it perfect to get it right you know all of these things playing with you um must be an intense process for you yeah you know I get uh uh I I would say I so interestingly this 10 year project i've actually until recently never had what someone might call a full time job um maybe when i was editing but but really all of those were sort of gig jobs in a sense you, you know what i mean a, a gun for hire or a, a hunter gather you know eating what you kill I've never had a corporate job. And so, and even when I would work on projects that I would really love, I might work on a hit TV series like, uh, um, um, you know, The X-Files or uh, 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 House or um, uh, The Americans or things like that. I, I never could stay more than a couple of years because I'm always restless and I always want to discover something new. So that, the thing is, while I've really, uh, I have enjoyed the process of working on this, uh, I'd also say that I I'm feeling sort of desperate to kind of get out of this world and do something new. And, and also something that is not quite as uh, dark and moody and and something that is, I've been experimenting things with things that are sort of brighter and lighter uh, to bring that to my life. Um, but it's just where I guess my psyche tends to gravitate. And, and and working on those other projects, those TV projects, that was all as as an editor or director. Oh or no! So uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I uh, I edited until um, about nineteen eighty six, and then mm -hmm. I started producing, and then um, I've really been a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mostly working as a director for the past, I don't know, 28 years. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's more or less, that's more or less the project. Okay. Wow. 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 I mean, this is, this has really been a great night. I mean, I haven't seen, uh, you know, we, we always have terrific people, but how great storytellers each of you are. It's, you know, you, you really shed some skin for us tonight. And that's, um, that's very, very rewarding. One thing I want to ask you guys, because I got a question earlier on from somebody, what is the process, you know, for entering into critical mass, the competition? How many times have you guys, you know, entered work there, you know, how you know what, what's the feeling about critical mass for you guys? Well, well, since not everybody's going to jump in here, go oh, Sarah. <laughs> at that one, I, I I I've been like um, uh, you know, always a bridesmaid and like never a bride. I think you know. I mean, I've been in the top two hundred a couple of times, but I've never done the top fifty. I mean, for the most part, it's been this work. Um couple other times it's been other projects I've been doing um I I had one comment and I do pay attention to those when they do the critical mass and I, I'm not calling out anybody but I thought it was kind of interesting because it said and it was a criticism it said the first paragraph reads like a good novel and I'm like damn that's good but <laughs> as it went on it sucked as a statement you know, I, I've had issues with my statements. That's why, you know, I, I say I, I'm not a writer. If I was a writer, I mean, I took creative writing. I mean, you know, but I'm I'm not a writer. I'm a photographer. Right. Can, okay. I, can, I, can I say something here? Yeah. I, I just want to say um, I really enjoyed tonight. And part of that is because I looked it up and my first critical mass that I was a reviewer for the finalist was back in 2005. 2005. So, um, um, so it, it goes back a long time. And so when you're in a reviewer situation, um, <laughs> the statements and all of that, for me, they were really 
not that important. You know, you, you had like 10 images, you had sometimes 1500 to 2500 images to look through and, you know, and assign a number. And it's, and seeing tonight, seeing all of your stories and hearing all of your comments reminded me of what an extraordinary honor it is to serve in that role. I mean, it, it just so brought me back to sitting at a session and seeing all that work and just thinking about these extraordinarily lot, these extraordinary lives, these extraordinary statements, the diversity of experience, um, and every single person that meets with you and every single portfolio you see as a reviewer for Critical Mass reminds you of that diversity. And it, it's and I happen to think Critical Mass is possibly the coolest gig going for a photographer. Yes. You yeah. know, I, I think <laughs> it doesn't cost you a fortune. You know, you don't have as much as I love hanging out in a hotel bar with people. Um, it, it offers so many people a chance to see such great work in a concentrated area. And I awarded probably 25 exhibitions to people out of critical mass. Wow. Because I still have every CD. And as I do work for the photo review, I still pull up all my critical mass CDs starting in 2005 to look at that work and remind myself of all this great work. So I just want to say thank you to everybody involved and and thank you for your efforts. It's just really, really just extraordinary. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I, and then, I, I guess I just to answer your question, I, I mean, really for the longest time, I, I, I really didn't even start entering my work in any competitions at all until 22, I guess. Uh, wow. I never really felt ready and I was insecure about it. And uh, I work with two really talented photographers uh, in different ways. And uh, they're both mentors to me, although one of them gets angry every time I refer to her as a mentor, which is th this uh, amazing street photographer, Julia Dean and documentary photographer, Julia Dean and, and this photographer, Susan Bernstein. And they just kept saying, you know, your work is good. You should put it out there. So uh, I finally did. So it, it honestly was the first time I had ever entered critical mass. It, I guess it's sort of an outlier. I was, but feel like really, you know, I'm again, incredibly blessed. And, you know, and especially when I see, you know, work from, you know, photographers like Rudy and Sarah, th those are really, it's a really heartfelt uh, deep and moving projects you know this uh my work is somewhat more abstract or conceptual i don't know how to put it but but uh um it, it's really it, it's it, it is a just an incredible community the photographic community in general is just it's such an amazing community and it's i, I think it, it to answer your earlier question like why do i put myself through it no part Partly because uh, I I just the, the working and being around artists is really fulfilling. It's just it makes your life richer. Yeah. So Daniel, as as we said, like go through it. You you must now come to the point where I'm going to go through it, and I know. Do you have the confidence to say I know I'm going to get it? Yeah, for sure. Because I finally found it. It just took me right. a really long time to find it. And I, I, you know, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the photographer, Trent Park. He, he's like, to me, like one of the, one of the finest street photographers living today. And he, you know, he says, you know, 98% of everything he shoots is just terrible. And he, he, but he's one of the hardest working photographers. I know he's out there every day. He's just relentless. And it just takes a lot of hard work. And I don't really mind the hard work. I'm sorry. Who did you mention? I didn't get that. Uh, Trent Park. Uh, Mark, yeah. Mark, magnum photographer. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I just didn't get that. And your two mentors? Oh, uh, Julia Dean and uh, Bernstein. Susan Bernstein. Susan Bernstein is a, 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 a fine art photographer. Um, and Julia is, a, 
you know, a wonderful street and documentary photographer. Yo, wh one thing I want to mention. Frank, Frank, to answer your question, yeah. um, I, I do not enter competitions. Not with these images. Um, I'm very close to them. I, I, I actually accompany my images with words as standard because I do not want anybody to take my work out of context. Mm -hmm. They belong. They're not vagrants. Um, um, they're not. They're not just people that that live on the street without homes. And so the story for me has to come I, I I usually say the words clothe my 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 images right and so I do not I do not ap apply for anything but my son who was also in the top 200 asked me to do it with him and so we applied together and we both got the 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 the, the email that said we're both Top two hundred, and and then he asked me if I wanted to do the top, go further for the top fifteen. I was like, oh, I'm done. We're good. And he's like, No, Dad, let's finish. And so when I got the email that I was the top fifty, I looked and I didn't see his name. I'm like, Oh Lord, no, I have to go call him. But he was just like, Dad, it only means that I'm gonna try. I'm I'm gonna try harder next time. And, and that, was the, right? that, was, the that was the lesson. That was the lesson. That was it. That was it. That was did it. you did you apply with did the images apply? that you showed us? I applied with the I ten. The ten images are in here. Okay. okay. Just curious. Yeah, and, and one thing everyone should know is that you know these uh, presentations will be up on YouTube in I don't know three or four days. So you know if you want to see them again which I mean, I, I think is, is almost mandatory for any photographer, uh, but it, anyone else that you want to see them, you will be able to see them on our, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, th that, that's Frank, always there. It's, Frank, can I say something? Yeah, Polly. Hi. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm Polly. I uh, ran critical mass this year. It was my first year um, doing it. And I had submitted, I used to do fine art photography. And so I've been on the other side of this. I've um, made the top 200 once and then not made it again. So, um, and it was really interesting to see how this year, it's very difficult to predict. Even when you're looking through all the portfolios, when you have you know, 150 something or 200 jurors, you, you really, you have no idea. And I think that's what I love about it the most. It's, um, it's very surprising, but also um, you don't have to be in the top 50 to get the benefit of having your work seen. There are a lot of people that have been selected for awards that have uh, secured exhibitions and so forth, just from the top 200. So that is something that is very unique about critical mass, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say as one of the judges, it really is a, um, you know, it really is hard. There is a lot of terrific work you know, out there, you know, by people that, you know, we've never heard of and, you know, on and on and on and, and people that, you know, so, you know, it's, um, you yeah, know, very, very prestigious. I, and when, when Polly reached out, I was, you know, I was a little bit humble that, you know, someone would ask me to be in the club that they're in, um, or Woody Allen line. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all, all you see is terrific work it's, and, and I'm, I'm so thrilled that, and, and thankful that we, uh, we pulled this together. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll, um, we yeah. will do more. Thank you so much, Frank. I appreciate you, you know, wanting to highlight some of our uh, finalists. And congratulations to uh, Daniel and Rudy and Sarah. Wonderful work, wonderful pr presentations. It makes me really proud to be part of the organization when I see photographers work like yours. So each of you... Where, where do you go with your projects? You know, what what is the next 
the next frontier, so to speak. <laughs> Rudy, I'll let you go first. Um, for me, well, other than the fact that I have this, my first show in Paris mm. come February, um, I continue to do new work. I was actually photographing fishermen down by the down by 55th and Marginal in Cleveland. And it's such a, a sweet story. Like during the during the warmer months, you will just see families, guys who just come there and throw a line and they will they will stay. And I, I go up to this one guy and I'm like, why are you here? Like, why do you do four or five hours? And he said, where he lives, there's so many gunshots that this is the respite. He said one day, and, and, and you know, you, you go there, you read people, your profile. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But I could tell that this guy was not the going out to the to restaurant kind of kind of dude. And he said this one time he went home and he just had this yearning to take his girlfriend to the restaurant. And she's like, where, where, you know, where, 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 did, where did we get all this money? And he's like, no, I just feel like we should. He goes, he goes to the restaurant, he comes home, and there's a bullet through his window, through the sofa, through the, the TV, right to, and that is where he plays Nintendo every night. Mm. And he says, ever since then, he just comes here, and he, and so, I just feel like, Right in this area where people fish is a repository of beautiful stories of people who just come down and share. And it's it's and in fact, I was actually while um Daniel was was talking, I was thinking of thinking of should I change this to a black and white project? Should I keep it color? I haven't done a black and white project in a long time. And again, something like critical mass. Um wanting to be with my son it inspires you you see other people's work and you're like ah new blood ah i'm not looking at my own stuff all the time like yeah i'm inspired by this and and there's this new this this renewed sense of hmm i haven't, I haven't done a black and white story in a long time so i like it yeah yeah that that that's a great word in you know because we're all is sort of in our own little vacuum, right? And then you come out of it for a moment, right? You come out of that shell and, you know, that, you know, seasoned photographers like you guys can be inspired is really, you know, a credit to your own, you know, allowing something else in to your head and into your psyche is really a great, great quality. Because, um, I mean, I, I feel that too, just because, like, you know, people mention other people's names that you've never heard of. You go see their work and you can't believe all this other great work is out. And like I say, we're all in our vacuum. So that that's a great point that, you know, something like Critical Mass can, you know, and, and they, these photographers can inspire you and, and push you, right? Like, get off your ass, get going, man, right? Nope. Like, you get, you get no time to, like, just relax, nope. right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff to do. You, you look you look at work, Sarah's work, I mean, and, and again, I'm predom my palette is predominantly in the black community and i said for my book to be finished i have to do the three b's i have to do a barbecue i have to do a baptism and i have to do a home going because because we're no longer using funerals right home going and so just like hearing hearing somebody you know making the dough make you want to like go into the the, the bakery and then yeah yeah there you go that's a great analogy great Great. Sarah? Yes, sir. Don't call me sir. Have you seen my old lady glasses here? <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, where am I going from here? Well, I think, you know, for me, like everybody, you know, you I want to do a book. I mean, I've had residents ask me for a long time, when are you going to do a book? I'm not going to do a self-published book. I don't have $65,000 sitting around to do a self-published book. I'm not, I don't want to end up with a bunch of books in my closet. When I do it, I want to do it right. And it's going to, I mean, I know what it's going to look like. I know the quotes that I'm going to use. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I know them and I know how it's going to look. Um, so if anybody wants to send me a lot of money or uh, buy a lot of prints or, you know, I think I, I am going to, you know, when you, when you talk about 
I did a Kickstarter right after it had just come out. And, you know, God, I think it was like 2010. And I did it and it was the worst experience of my entire life because all the people who you thought were going to give you money didn't. I mean, I photographed somebody very, very wealthy. And it was, it was, I'm not going to say the client. And his comment to me was, why don't you go ask Oprah? And you know who donated money to my Kickstarter project? And you know who got the prints? The residents. The residents of the community were my biggest contributors. Those are your community. Exactly. You know, right? I mean, that was right here. And then there was a weird group of Australians, which I have no idea why. <laughs> I'd like to maybe I should go there. But they gave me, but that it was like, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it, yes, sir. No, you, I said, from, okay, sir. <laughs> worst, worst, worst come to worst, you can self publish and have the book, have the book. Stay where the publisher is, and your community buy the book straight from the publisher. So Blur. you have you never have that that stack at home. So oh, all I... you, so all you have to do is to tell everybody the book is here. We go buy it. You print as you go. You print as you go. Yeah, blurb blurb does that. Does the number blurb does that? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, you want? I want to. It's about honor and respect. Yeah. You know? And and I appreciate um, you saying it is my community because, I mean, they are. I moved yeah. here. You, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And, um, you know, I love what I do. I yeah. Love what I mean, I, you know, that, that's something that maybe we should do. Uh, I don't know how, how we, we could talk about it, Polly. Maybe, you know, doing like um, having come someone present about grant writing right you know or you know or, or, uh, Sarah I'm not trying to kill you but you know I'm just saying grant writing I just want to say give me the money <laughs> well I don't know what platform that would work because you probably need two more words at least but yeah, profanity <laughs> right yeah. sorry, sorry 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 Sarah this is a family um a family entity sorry sorry, sorry I'm sorry. only kidding but but you no, know, I mean just something you know for everyone to like maybe yeah. this to grab out of it uh, that that could really that. work. Yeah. Can I ask a question? May I? Yes. Um, well, first of all, it was a wonderful presentation. I won't go on and on about it, but it was amazing. By all three of you, I really appreciate all the insight that you brought um, to the audience about your work. Um, the I have actually a, a question for is it Rudy or Ruddy? Ruddy. I thought. Oh, it's like in between, sort of Ruddy. No, it's Ruddy as in the color, as in muddy, Ruddy. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, because some people are calling you Rudy, so I got a little confused. I, I go with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to know. I know that you are photographing sometimes on assignment and so forth, and I just wondered um, how many areas do you specifically choose areas to go to photograph because there's a story there that you um, are interested in you and you know, you yourself. Um, all the time, all the, especially, especially if, okay. So you send me an assignment in Mississippi and while I'm on assignment, my feelers go out and I collect barnacles. When I go back to New York, I have notes, numbers, I call, I say, I'm coming back in two weeks and I'm there for a month. And 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 that's that's the way you get your personal projects done. And where do you, and I know these are sort of getting down to the tech brass tacks of things, but, and maybe this is for all of you, like where do you stay when you're working like Sarah, I guess also, but where do you stay when you're working on these projects? I mean, do you find someone to stay with? Cause that's what gets expensive for, photographers who want to do stories is you know the where they stay when they're in these places and so forth um so let me start and then you go on the line um that's why you that's why you meet people ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know you 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 i you i i stayed with um the, the doc the doc after it was a it was a 
pro pro publica it was a pro publica story and i kept in touch with the doc and i called him back when i was ready to go back down and i was able to stay at his he had a little villa outside of his house and i was able to stay there for a month so though i mean it's always it's either that or a, an airbnb and um i i try to save money so that i can at least do that i don't eat as often when i'm on a sign when i'm on personal projects but i always try to find somewhere to stay so because you also have to come home and debrief and like put the images on a hard drive go through the images again to see what you have and and, and for me that is also a, a, a very irreverent part a reverent part of the project and i need that space and time so i need to have a place that i i feel comfortable in got it thank you and and for you sarah did when you were traveling from chicago did you always stay with someone there initially or initially you know i was coming down here because i was working for a, a magazine that is now defunct and then I, in the early time there was um it was a bed and breakfast and I exchanged photography for stays for a really long time and did a lot of the barter system, you know. Um, okay. Then there was, you know, my daughter and I, I mean, a lot of times I would be da doing down and backs. I mean, it was it was rough. It was like a night and then drive back and, you know, then you get older. And then there was, you know, there was some deals. There was a woman named Amy and my daughter and I would come down for two weeks and it was really, really cheap. And, you know, and, and sometimes you stay with the, the residents and sometimes you want to remain friends because, you know, I'm not <laughs> without coffee in the morning. And I think what Ruddy says, you do need times sometimes to decompress. I mean, mine is black and white film. I can sit on film sometimes. I hate to say it for months because I have to, I don't process it myself. Because when I, where I lived in Illinois, I had uh, iron in my water and it wasn't, you know, I'm not a dark room person. I'm a, you know, going out and shooting person. So barter system, friends. Thank you. You gave me some ideas. I did that one time. I exchanged prints and so forth. So I just, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Being cagey is, is part of the DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Being cagey. I showed, I showed up in Mrs. French's house with a suitcase and my daughter because this woman gave me a house. And it was so disgusting, I couldn't stay there. I, we, I had to go in their house and change with my suitcases. So I don't want to monopolize, but I do have one other question. I'm really sorry. And that is to Dan. You're paying. Oh, wait, wait. This, this question you have to pay for. The first two are free. <laughs> oh, okay. How much? <laughs> we'll discuss that later on. All right. Um, I have a question for Dan. And I just wondered because, um, you know, one of the things I always wonder about, there's so many social issue types of bodies of work now and so when you are doing something sort of conceptual or different in that way sometimes it makes you wonder about submitting you know work because you know it's not maybe the direction so i just wondered though um are you are you doing a lot of post processing on your work or collaging because the effects it's beautiful i mean it's just you know um you know i mean surprisingly not all that much post-processing it it's i mean it's mostly in the exposure but no i don't do any you mean like a compo a lot of composite work yeah and i mean i won't think less of you you do no no I, I process Just totally yeah. totally get it. well uh, uh i mean uh anything that that uh i show as uh because i have this project with julia dean which is um called projecting la which is uh an event coming up in 24, which is where we show a uh, documentarian uh, street stories, news, and uh, street photography work projected 80 feet wide, three stories high on a screen outside. It's, it's a bit, this big event. Anyway, I, uh, anything that I show can't be altered. Um, she's uh, very strict okay. about that. Uh, things that I, I, you know things that I do to work on. Obviously, I um, uh, I hold off to the side, or rather, I don't use in that venue. But no, but but um, I, I mean, I uh, it, it's not that I wouldn't like to do a, a project that is more geared towards social justice. I I would, 
but I don't honestly know what that project is. And, and I'm not even sure that I'm the right person to do it, to be honest. Some, sometimes you just have to be honest, like, is it my story to tell? Um, oh, and I'm know? not suggesting that, I'm not in any way suggesting that your project yeah. was any the less or, right. or anything like that. I, I didn't know. take it that way. I, okay, all right. Because I mean, I do things that have a lot to do with shape and form that's kind of where photography also is very strong. So, I mean, I didn't, yeah. Okay. I you didn't know, uh, also my, I mean, you know, my, my brother is a, as a fashion photographer uh, and his work is, I mean, it's just like pure art to me. Uh, so even though it has a, 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 you know, a commercial purpose, it's, it's just like, this beautiful art infused with real uh, emotion and energy to it. Uh, so I, I, I guess, you know, and I think of the works of someone like Avenon or um, God, uh, you know, uh, uh, a half dozen, uh, uh, you know, uh, fashion photographers who, whose work is, uh, uh, I mean, I'm really drawn to, uh, for me, it's about. Mervyn Penn. I was just going to say, Penn, yeah. thank you, Ruddy. Yes. You know, to me, it, it's about, does the work stop you from turning the page and, and evoke something in you that, that, um, um, that's why I think it's such a, a I love the, the world of photography because really it's, it's, it, it's sort of a, it, it, it's sort of a, such a huge ecosystem in which to work. Where, where you can have a project like Ruddy's and Sarah's and mine and 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 that they all uh, have a value even though they're all very different. different. I think yeah, yeah. I think I think um, it's really important. I think your work number one is really beautiful. And you know, I would teach these documentary classes to to kids who, you know, didn't always have it easy. And it's like there isn't any wrong way or right way to to photograph, you know, go out and do what feels right to you. You have to, I mean, <clears throat> if you feel good about it, feel good about it. I mean, I, I, I went to school and just was ripped on for doing documentary work because I wasn't a conceptual artist. I was doing documentary work. I was photographing fishermen on the Chicago lakefront. And I just got, I remember those critiques. And I think, I don't think people should do that to anybody. I mean, because you have to be happy within yourself, really, and what you're doing and feel good about your work. That's, that's just my two cents. I mean, I, I, I find it the opposite. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, black imagery does not work in a, in a social, in a social system where they're, they're underneath. And so I find that, okay, I'll give you a story. Um, I was invited to Everyday USA years ago. And the first image I put up on Everyday USA platform, it got through trashed. This is not the USA. We don't want any of these images on it. Da, 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 da. And I remember I was in a theater watching a documentary. Um, oh my God, why is that killing me now? Um, Thomas's documentary on can't remember and I sat back and I and I made everyday black America in that theater just because I know that we needed a space where our images could just live I don't think we're at a place yet where where a black woman dressed exactly the same way as anybody else is not going to be scrutinized differently or a black man who might have a, a to, to talk about fashion? I worked at Vogue for two years as a as an assistant, and if I put on a a, t a tear of t shirt that I got from a thrift store, V neck, it feels sexy to me. If I put it up without a caption, that same image is going to be considered different from another image of somebody who looks something completely different, and so. I found myself having to caption my images, as I said, to put clothes, clothes on them because I did not want my image to veer away from the dignity or the, the beauty 
that it that I found and photographed. Oh, I, I'm just saying with, with kids, I let them find themselves. I'm not okay. You know, it's I'm not dictating anything. I want with my students, I want them to photograph and tell me the story, you know? And and, and the only lesson that I ever use when I teach and I've taught in shelters and all over the place, not mainstream, is I use one quote. That's from Lewis, Lewis Hine. I wanted to show something that should be appreciated or I wanted to show something that needed to be changed. That And I use that. That's, that's how, that's how I, I work. Powerful. And that's what I tell my kids. And the things that they've come back with have been everything. It's like, you know, the gang violence. Then I got to say, you can't show colors because you don't want anyone to get it hurt. You got to be careful. I don't want you to get hurt, you know? And and what they have come up with by that little quote, and I had I had one girl, Maria, and I was like, tell me about this picture. I'll never forget it. And, and then they didn't want to run it. And she had a kid holding a gun and his arms were crossed, right? In a certain fashion. And behind him, 16 years old, was this one of these Indian lamps and the Indian Native American indigenous, you know, again, I don't want to say, Got it. you know, Got you. and holding a gun in this lamp, arms crossed the same way. And behind that was a, was a carpet, was a rug. It was the Virgin Mary. And it was like 16 and I'm looking at this picture. I'm like, Oh man, so tell me about this picture. She says, well, look at, he's holding a gun. You got the lamp that's holding the gun and they say they're all religious and peaceful. Mm -hmm. 16. You know how, you know how I get around the, 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 the colors, the, the, the gang colors. I say you have to photograph it in black and white. Oh. <laughs> yeah. the, the color, yeah, the colors, the colors. Then you got the signs. Then you got the signs. The signs. No, I, but, I, but, but, the, but colors, like you're gonna, if you're gonna show me black and white. No, yeah, it, does, it sort of democratizes. It democratizes it if you're not seeing the things that inflame. You miss the point sometimes, right. or maybe sometimes that is the point. I, you know, it depends on the image. But I yeah. was with Jesse Jackson on the South side and it was a big story. And there were all these kids from various schools and the, and you know what he said to the whole, all the group of kids who got in the pictures, he looked at him and said, no crooked fingers. Love that. Don't bend them up. Right, right, right. right. It was just like, okay, okay. I'm going to remember, going to remember that one. So I don't know. Yeah, and and there's something that the, the, going going back to that first question, and I knew what you were asking. You were asking how how does anybody photograph contemporary work in a time when social justice seemed to be the the theme? For me, social justice is everything. Yeah, it's the water we all drink from. So Daniel's images for me are social justice. It it all depends. On that image that he has with the the train and the the road that runs across, yeah, that that to yeah. me is a story is a story about public transportation, perfect and about climate change. I mean, like it all depends on how you write it up, or the graveyard with those shapes. Right, 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 right. Yeah, like it's yeah. all social justice to me. So yeah. don't sell yourself short, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, no, but, but, but that really, the, the words behind the images really are so valuable, right? It gives you the context, you know, ver versus just looking at images, right? I mean, it really puts you in that place because those, yeah. those those stones would, I mean, what an incredibly powerful image that was. At a, at a time when truth and fake news are intertwined. Mm. It's important that we have this this forum and, and, and the discussions around the images. Yeah. No. So right, Ruddy. So I mean unprecedented times. Yes. To, to put it Hi, mild. Ruddy. 
I, I just wanted to make one point here or something that I think that that should also be spoken about is Boom. is the history of photography, right? Knowing who's come before us. And traditionally... Can I interrupt you? Yes. For the last four years that I have taught in any class, I have yet to ask five questions back that way that I have gotten answers for. To your point, these, oh. kids, do, these kids do not know yeah. back then. Well, just, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm curious about is, is exploring. Um, photography has traditionally been a white uh, art form. And what I'm excited about is seeing your work. Um, when I look at your work, I think of Roy D. Carava. Um, Be honored you by saying that. There's, there's a huge difference if, if, if I go into a community, a Black community, and I try to start making photographs, and you go into that community, or any other Black person goes into that community and starts making photographs, mm -hmm. the, uh, 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 the authenticity in some aspects are going to be different. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to look at the trajectory of photography to start seeing the, the new narratives of non-white people and how they're portrayed and the stories and narratives behind that. So I thank you for your work and thank you for being here. I appreciate you for but, saying but that, brother. You, you could I turn appreciate it on. a lot. I mean, th that all makes sense. But, you know, look at the work that Sarah did and she ingratiated herself with people. Uh, they may be they were African American people, but they were still people, and she built that trust and that hard work. It may be a little bit harder to get into that community, but once whatever that community, I mean, that's Rudy, that's you shooting white firemen, in, you know, in a firehouse in in um, in Staten Island, for instance, right? If you build that trust, you know, and it it it, it may take more time because of the inherent friction that there is but you can do it i mean you know say, and yeah say, no I, i'm not i'm not i'm not suggesting no, no, that i know a, that i'm yeah, just saying it's hard yeah. work it's yeah, a lot absolutely work. you know it's it's, yeah. it's something that that when when i was in ukraine and working with the um uh a woman uh photographer um in the beginning we were mostly around women and just even watching her uh interact with the women she was going to be able to get photographs that I would never be able to get ever. And so. Um, I, I'm going to, you know, a little bit disagree with that. I mean, it's, it's, it really is about relationships. And, and one of the things I start out with my work, I'm not black. I will never have the experiences that they did. I, I did a story on Sandra Bland. And if you don't know who she is, look her up. She was pulled over and she they found hung texas she was from my neighborhood in my, you know my area she was pulled over and found hank I, I i don't get pulled over you know my like that you know i am you know not driving while black you know dwb you know my friend was like dwb l which was driving while black with alexis i don't get pulled over like that i will never have those experiences can i sympathize Absolutely. Am I black? No. But if we do not talk about race, we're never going to get anywhere either. And I think I think that's important. You know, I am never going to have those experiences. And I, I, I admit that coming in. But, yeah. but I think it's but, so important for childhood to be rich, because I think also, though, that you, Sarah, that I think certain people like you, are, you bring something to a situation that is intan that's intangible but is felt and i think that that can really make such a big difference and so when when patrick was mentioning i i get what he's talking about i mean we all have different spheres of experience and so oh. naturally we're going to connect more perhaps depending on what that may be whether it's woman or man or black or you know whatever it's overcoming and not letting certain things stand in the way that you know well, and, and women in photography is not, you know, that's not really like a norm. You know, when I graduated school, I went to a catalog house, no bar, 1133 South Wabash, 26 male photographers, 13 male assistants, and me. Mm -hmm. And I quit 
because some guy who didn't know what he was doing was promoted ahead of me. And I was out. And then I worked as a freelance assistant carrying cases. I mean, 50 pound cases. My friend Sue and I, who were freelance together, you know what? She was here last week from Chicago. You know what we were doing? We were talking about our MRIs because we were always afraid to say <laughs> no to carrying cases that we'd lose our jobs. It it's still it's a male dominated field. Don't don't forget that. At least that's that that was my feelings coming out. I'd like to say it's changed. We all have barriers. I'm I'm not black, you know. I but sat, I sat with twenty five black photographers in New York in a group called Komonge. I know who they are. Um, and when I went into the group, I was in my mid thirties. Everybody was my age now, mid fifties. And I have, over the last 20, 20 years, seen why they were so angry and filled with rage. Because we would we would go to exhibitions as a group, and I could hear them say, and, I, and I'm being honest, I have that, I have that, I have that, I have that, I have that. And their wives would say, yes. The reason we didn't go on that vacation because of that, because of that. And over the next the last 20 years, I have felt the same story. Now, as, as it relates to this conversation we're talking about, I've always said my one of my favorite photographers, and he's all it's also great to call him a friend. He's the only man that has ever kissed me, Eugene Richards. Eugene Richards work, work got black people angry. But you know what made me love this guy? This guy sat in a chair at ICP and took it. He did not, he did not, he did not excuse himself. He said, give it to me. Give me your questions. Ask me why I was in that community. No, at the end of it, and I can tell you in 20 years, this is what black photographers or the black community have always wanted to see. If there's going to be white photographers in our communities, we want to see white photographers in their communities, not photographing it the same way, but photographing the things that created the problems in black community. It has never been done. I do not know of a white photographer who has gone out and photographed redlining, who has photographed Jim Crow, who has photographed. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? White photographers always, I, I'll give you an example. I, I was given an assignment to go photograph food deserts in New York. It was supposed to be five photographers. I was the only black one. Do you know where the other four white people were? They were in the committees I was photographing. Nobody went over to the white communities. And so the narrative is always, the sweetness is where, because that's what the editors want. Mm. We, we, yeah, we, which is a whole other category, right? Which is a whole other. But for me, I am at, I'm at 54 years old. I can, I say unequivocally, anybody should be able to go photograph because I need to see what Sarah is going to produce. Right. There is nothing like seeing what the other produces. However, I'd like to see the other photograph their community in a way that helps Black community. True. Got to think about that. Yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, I... Different set I've of always, I've always yeah. gone where my path kind of leads me, whether it's a white community or a black community or it's rodeo. I've always gone to be a photographer to educate myself. Word. And I'm trying to educate myself. And if I can educate myself, hopefully I can educate others. And with my project, The Home Place, and I got in a huge argument with a photo editor and I said, well, you know, all you're exhibiting, and she was white, all you're exhibiting of black imagery is pit bulls and pimps. Word. And you know what? And I said to her, and she said, you're just choosing 
to not photograph them in your communities that you're working in. I said, you're assuming that they're there. Right. And they're not. Through that. Word. I got, so, a, I, got, I got a question. Roddy, why when we send you to Chicago to photograph gangsters, you did not, this is Time Magazine, you did not bring me back gangsters. I said, because I didn't see any. I saw brothers, I fathers, nephews. Right. Uncles. That's what I saw. I said, if the gangster had turned up, I would have photographed him. But I didn't see any. I saw <laughs> fathers and brothers and sons and uncles and nephews. That's what you got. <laughs> oh, I get it. Sarah, I get it. Well, I know you do. <laughs> You're working it. out. It's just, it's 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 just sad. And if we can fix it, you got to you got to try. That's why you photograph. That's why you photograph. Yeah. You know, twenty three years. I thought it'd be six weeks. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know, now I just you know it's like where do I live? I don't even know. I'm just like renting place to place to be to be, to be close. Mm. You know. Steve. Family, family's where you find it. Family's where you find it. I like that. That's, Guys, your, next pro- that's your next project. <laughs> There's a whole lot of there. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> what's the next topic? Family's uh, where you find it. Yeah, there you go. No, I like that. It's- yeah, just give me, you know, give me, give me ten percent of all those jobs, Rudy. You got a lot more clients than I do. <laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> oh, it's a rough game out there. Yeah. It's it's a rough game. Well, I I think, I mean, yeah, th- this has just been <laughs> phenomenal. Just really, really wonderful. What a, what a great night that you guys have uh, supplied to us, and you know, Polly for pulling it together. It's um. Really, really wonderful. I, I, uh, we have to do it again, you know. I, I, and you know, as as each of you progress in in your work, and you know, please, please, you know, let me know, and we can come and do this again. And um, I can't tell you how how gratifying, you know, an evening like this is for us. It's <laughs> it's really, really wonderful. Um, and like I said, you know, this will all be up on YouTube, and you know. If I have to be honest with everyone, if I didn't have to go to the bathroom and take a leak, I could be here for another two hours. Great. We'll let you do. We'll let you do that. We we don't want to be man, responsible. Man. We don't want to be responsible for bladder or kidney issues. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you to everybody and and to Sarah and Reddy. A real pleasure meeting you both. Pleasure. Thank you, Polly. Yeah, thank you, and, and, guys. Uh, thank you so much for including me. It was really uh, nice. Uh, no, that, that, that's a great job. No, that's a great job. And um, um, anyone else, you know, from Critical Mass, or, you know, or, or if you guys know other great photographers that I don't know, send them my way. You know, this is this is what the, our platform is about. It's it's these kind of conversations, you know, and people that I don't know doing special special work. You know, or, or just starting out, even, you know, young people. I do a lot of mentoring. You know, we want young people up who we can help, you know, you know, criticize them in, in the most positive way. Do this, do that. Um, that That's really what, what the platform is about. And like I said, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're doing a whole thing on Gaza and Israel. And we're continuing our project with um, uh, with the uh, photojournalist uh, covering the war in Ukraine. So, you know, and, and I have to tell you one thing I was, you know, about men and women, there are so many great oh, yeah. female photojournalists, you know, Carol Guzzi and um, Heidi and I mean, and Lindsay Adair, you know, this, you know, in that, in that space, there is, I, I would almost say it's equal, you know, with oh, yeah. phenomenal photojournalists covering war. It's unbelievable. Really, really, you know, Heidi Levine and uh, Paula Bronstein. I mean, just great, great work. Um, but tonight was all about critical mask, and you, you guys really were were just just great. I, I can't, I cannot thank you enough um, for for coming in. And what I always like to do is, you know, give each photographer the last, you know, words of the evening. So, being that. Um, you went last, Daniel. You'll go first now. Just you know, close us out with with a comment, whatever you'd like to say. I just wanted to say that I 
always enter these things with a bit of trepidation as public speaking, but <clears throat> it really has been so rewarding just and to and to get to um see some of the work here tonight and 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 actually just you know hear the commentary afterwards it's just um uh i i i if certainly if i don't get to speak again i will be tuning in for future uh for future webinars thank you so much for hosting great i'll i'll go next so siri has the last word no <laughs> um i i'm I always find that coming to the well allows for for recalibration, recentering, um, rejuvenation, um, a, a, a sense of inspiration, and 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 family. I am from Jamaica, where I know everybody on my street, and so community is a huge thing for me. And just to open up my world to a, a larger community. Um, made this night special for me. So I want to thank um, Critical Mass. I want to thank Sarah and Daniel and Frank, um, Jay. I won't forget Jay. Um, and I want to thank everybody who participated, who came um, in and offered their questions because we, we, we as art makers or photographers or, or painters or, or whatever, whatever our vocation is, we need the feedback from the the people which which we're trying to inspire or serve in order to know that we're on the right path or we're veering or 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 the work that we're doing is 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 necessary anymore because we can we can actually start to do stuff that's old um for lack of a better word and so it is always good to hear new blood and to hear new ideas so that it kind of refreshes what we're doing. So, I, I mean, I want to thank everybody who, who participated today. All right. Now the lady finishes us, finishes no. us off. No, I think it's been, I think it's been really good. I mean, it's an honor to be here and, and, and talk with Rudy and Ruddy. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, um, Try to correct myself. That's why I'm on board now, Ruddy. I don't, I don't usually like to say people's names, you know, because I am so scared of saying something wrong. Um, I think it's been really good. I mean, if you think about it, photographers, we're out there really by ourselves for the most part, you know, and with subjects or, you know, Daniel is is working with his work. I mean, it, it, which is more, it seems, you know, more isolated, um, which I love your work and stop beating yourself up um, really? because it's really beautiful. Um, but we don't often share our work. You know, I... I don't, I know that. I mean, in photographers, I'm sorry, they tend to be sometimes not a very nice group of people, you know, because a lot of times it gets overly competitive. competitive. Yep. Oh yeah, I was photographing Obama in the early stages and this young punk was up there and he was elbowing everybody and this little man comes in and he's got a bow tie He's a black guy. And this kid was so rude to him. And I turned over to him. I said, do you have any idea who that is? That is John White. He taught every photojournalist in Chicago how to do their job. I said, he's won a Pulitzer Prize. He's done everything. So you better get over yourself and show some respect. I was just, it was just rude. You don't need to, you don't need to be like that. Nope. You just don't. So having an evening like this where we're talking about work, we're seeing each other's work. And I think we've been pretty damn civil to each other. I've learned a lot. And I thank you for hosting it, you know? No, it, it, I, I'm, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna have to say the last word. Okay. Um, I photographed <laughs> Robert Frank on the streets of New York four years ago. It was, it was, it was a couple of years before he had his home, home, home passing. And I put it up on my Instagram. And nobody recognized him for almost a week. Nobody. Mm -hmm. And it told me something. It's not about the person. Always about the work. Yep. It will always be about the work. Yep. 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 It's I, not about me. It's 
about the people I photographed. I think that's okay. See, now I got the last word. There you go. That was not my intention. But that was perfect. That was perfect. And if you go to Houston, which I was there, go see the Frank Webb exhibit. Museum of Fine Arts Houston. It is probably one of the best exhibits I have seen in a long time. Ooh. And I don't think his picture was up of himself. And you know what? It didn't matter. Uh, well, well, Frank, he's going to have I, a medical I, episode. <laughs> I need to go pee. I need to go pee. I'm no, no. I'm going to get the last word. That the reason why this was so great was your imagery and the words behind your imagery, your storytelling, your process, your journey. You know, you engaged all of us in your own different journeys, and that's that's what really, for me, gave you know it all context. More as much as the imagery, it's the words and and your 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 journeys. So, um, great. I mean, I, I don't have to piss anymore. Damn, it's gone. <laughs> it's, I'm in a puddle, but so what? Um, uh, That's the last word. There you go. That's um, the last word. Th thank you so much, everybody. It's really, really great. And you know, standing invitation to come back when, whenever you want. Just re reach out, and like I said, if you have colleagues that are doing special work, you know, let me know. But thank you so much.